And so, so this is the here, which is kind of an instruction as we that should be here if we can see the line. So you get too excited to accept it. So I will welcome everyone to uh, Solar Research Program 317, the program that we started. I keep closing. I keep closing. One second. So we have a few minutes left. Uh, program we started about uh, four years ago. We've been developing and uh, providing our results ever since. Today, what I want to do is to uh, take us back to the beginning of uh, the importance of this problem and set it up for the students. I mean, I'm just there to guide the students, really. I don't want to say too much. <laughs> I just want the students to tell what they've been doing. So, uh, so, most of you have heard of earthquakes, uh, devastating problem around the world. Frequency has been increasing the last 10 years. Every time it comes along, there's an earthquake somewhere. And you've also heard of uh, some significant earthquakes in the last four years. For example, Haiti 2010, um, seven years ago, um, earthquake happened for like about 15 minutes, 300,000 people. About six or seven billion dollars in damages. Earthquake happened in Japan, 2011. Uh, there, because there was tsunami and all that stuff, they had about 16,000 people die, and uh, 400 billion dollars in damages. So it's becoming a serious problem. And the question that we try to ask is, why is it that nothing has been done about this problem? There used to be a time where you're going to have a hurricane and it's going to wipe out, wipe out the city because we didn't know how to predict these things, right? believe it or not, right? So why is it that we cannot develop ways of doing the same for earthquakes? And the primary reason for that is because this requires a lot of disciplines to come together. One of the things that scientists have had as a, as a weakness is that they don't know how to work together. <laughs> it's a funny thing, right? And so if you go and you look at literature in this problem, Every single scientist is looking at what the other scientist is doing, trying to shoot it down. Okay? This particular problem is a problem that's going to require for all of them to put themselves together, or else we'll never solve this problem. Because it requires inputs from all kinds of disciplines, from engineering to computer science to systems to geology to uh, chemistry, everywhere almost. So we need to find a way to use everything that we've had so far in order to develop capability that can do forecasting for earthquake. Now, if you talk to people in the field about earthquake forecasting, they'll say, we do have earthquake forecasting. Then you wonder why is it that that's not helping us prevent or know that an earthquake is going to uh, occur. The earthquake forecasting that they're talking about is the probability that an earthquake will occur in a particular region of the Earth. Say, for example, 90% probability if not 99, that you're going to have an earthquake in California within, a, within the next 10 years. What magnitude and where? We don't know. So this kind of forecasting, while interesting, is not the kind of forecasting that we need for the future. What we really need is to build earthquake for earthquake prediction capabilities, just like we can predict an hurricane and such. So we need to find a way to move from that thinking of earthquake forecasting to a thinking of earthquake, earthquake prediction. And ENC has its own approach to this problem. To begin with, we say, use everybody's work, okay? Not just what we're doing here, but use everybody's work and try to see if we can put that together into a more coherent picture. Because one of the things that you're gonna see as we go through this, presentation, every single one of these parameters that we're using, are witness, are, they are witnesses. So every single one of them can be wrong at any given time. So the idea is, why not use all of them together? And some of the ones that we've been looking at in the last three or four years are, what happens when works are under stress? We know that when we're going to have earthquake, uh, there's significant stress that 
that are taking place in the works months before the earthquake happened? Are there things that happen when work are under stress that we can sense? If the, there are things that happen that we can sense in, in the uh, stress coming from the rocks, do they create other phenomena like, like changes in the earth magnetic field? Do they create things like changing in the air chemistry at the surface of Earth? Do they change the, the chemistry of the water under the Earth? And do they do anything at all to the several layers of the atmosphere? For, for example, the troposphere from 0 to 40 kilometers, the atmosphere, the uh, ionosphere from 40 to, to about 1,000 kilometers. What happened in those areas? So we've been looking at this, and uh, you're going to have presentation in all these areas by various students and works that they've done in the field. And what we propose is to take all of this data, combine it with all works that have been done in the field that we know of, with any, limited, with any kind of success, and create what we call a data assimilation and fusion platform for a quick forecasting. What that means is you take all this data, you bring it in, you assimilate it into a form that is suitable, you fuse it, that means you create out of 10 parameters, you create one single parameter, and you try to use that for earthquake forecasting. The reason why you're doing that is you're saying to yourself that if one of these parameters is wrong, they cannot all be wrong at the same time. So if the fusion mechanism is effective and all of them are saying something to you, or most of them are saying something to you, then you can have some trust in that thing that they're saying to you. So that's the idea. So here's a chart about earthquakes here that have been happening around the world in the last, oh, what is that, 100 years, 115 years or so. And when we look at that, we see the red areas, uh, Asia, for example, uh, green area, South America, we have North America, which is this purplish thing, and Europe. And as we look at this in, in terms of proportion, it would appear as if Asia is a place that is in trouble. America is out of the fort. So we don't have anything to worry about. What's the big fuss? Right? right? Don't worry for America. Right? Well, I'll tell you, if there was an earthquake of a magnitude 6 in the back bay, it will be gone. Okay? That's, it's not, I'm not frightening anybody of saying that. If we have a magnitude of earthquake 6 in the back bay area, it will be gone. So it is a significant problem, right? We're not used with it, but it's coming. And when it does come, there's going to be some serious problem if we don't know that it's coming. Now, if we look at, in terms of spending, we see, for example, um, I just told you about that, $235 billion from Japan. There was another one here, uh, $800 million. So we've jumped back and forth in damages. And then if we look at America, again, we have 1994, $1344 million in Los Angeles. In 1906, we had $400 million. Again, we're jumping back and forth in terms of um, uh, significant damages. Um, so again, in terms of damages that's happening around the world, we see this problem becoming more important. Potential for a big earthquake in America from in the scale in the next two to three years. Anybody thinks that's going to be a big earthquake in this magnitude in America within the next three years? Most people will say they don't think so, but I think we know the answer to this question. I, I predict that within the next 10 years in, in uh, California, we're going to have an earthquake of that magnitude. So what can we do? And as I've told you, earthquake forecasting is very much a tool field, but it doesn't tell us what we need to know. So we need to develop techniques for earthquake prediction. And some of the techniques here is what the students are going to discuss throughout the day. I'm going to forego these slides and move to that. So just to explain to you where the, uh, the, the, the signals that the, the students are going to present coming from, we say that when an earthquake is going to occur, we start having problems from the belly of the earth all the way to the, at the atmosphere. Okay? We, have, we have signals that are under the earth, signal at the earth's surface, 
signal within the surface of the Earth and signal way up in the atmosphere somewhere. And just to give you a sense for that, we have this cartoon here. We think that most of the problem, most of the original uh, actions that's creating the things that we see in earthquake take place here. <coughs> it's what's called the, the Earth's core, except that we don't understand anything about that. There are other areas of the Earth, um, the Earth outer core and what they call the Earth metal, so that this is all inside the Earth, very hot. Then you go to the outer core, then you go to the mantle, you come in close to the Earth's surface. There are also things that happening in these two areas that we don't know much about. But we do start seeing things on the surface of Earth. For example, uh, perhaps too late, but we, see, we start seeing things on the surface of Earth. And this thing that we see on the surface of Earth made a, made a step and go back to see what's happening under the Earth's surface, at the Earth's surface and beyond. So the first thing you're gonna, the first few things you're gonna hear about is what's happening on the Earth's surface when a square earthquake is gonna occur. Okay. Rock that are under stress, what can we sense from that? Then if we have these phenomena, what does that do to below the Earth in the water that is below the Earth? 100 to 300 feet below the Earth. And as we move to the Earth's surface and beyond, what is it that's happening here, for example, for the air at the Earth's surface as a result of these changes in uh, rock chemistry? And then we're going to go further in the Earth, troposphere trop there, see what's happening. And then we're going to go way out in the Earth's atmosphere to see what's happening uh, in it. So you're going to hear a little bit of all of that today. So, the question is, any other stuff that we're going to present now, are they going to show promise in earthquake prediction? And if they do, what is it that they're revealing to us that gives us some sense or some confidence that at some point they may be able to help us with earthquake prediction? If not, what else can we look at? So that was the primary purpose for some research, was to try to address some of these questions and see if we can contribute to insight and inputs that have been developing around the world from other scientists. And so today, you're going to see, we've done the coffee already. Um, <laughs> so we're going to see uh, a top level overview that's going to be done by Caleb and Josh on the last mediation platform. Then we start with the what we call the precursors. Precursors are signals that are taking place sometime months before an earthquake. Uh, that may be able to tell us of their impending arrival. So change in the magnetic field. What happened when rocks are under stress? What happened in the water? What happens with what we call total electron content, which is something that's happening in the Earth's atmosphere? And then we come back and blend all this in uh, data assimilation platform design um, and functionality. Any questions so far? Any question? Good. So you're not going to hear anything about me anymore for the rest of this presentation, which I'm very, very glad about. And uh, it's going to be all students from now on. Thank you. Technical difficulties with the live stream, so just bear with us for a moment. Did you say I wasn't live? No, you were live. Oh, okay. <laughs> you were live. So uh, my name is Caleb Batchel. Uh, I'm Josh Loisem. Uh, we'll be kicking off the student portion of the presentations today uh, by giving a brief overview of sort of uh, what our approach is to the earthquake forecasting problem and how we've been attacking it as a team. Uh, 
All right, so just a brief outline um, kind of what we're going to start off with. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about the problem, uh, which Dr. Portland introduced, uh, talking about earthquakes and seismic and pre-seismic signals. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about some system requirements for, uh, for a platform, talk about uh, briefly methodologies, and uh, you'll actually hear about results uh, kind of towards the end of the entire session today when we come back up and talk about kind of bringing it all together, uh, bringing the work that all of the students have done together in the actual platform. Uh, so as Dr. Cornley already mentioned, over the past 100 years or so, uh, there have been various studies on a bunch of what we call earthquake precursors. So these are signals that we see in various levels of the Earth, uh, all the way down from below the crust of the Earth to up to the ionosphere and above. Uh, so ENC's approach uh, is we want to take a look at both seismic signals and pre-seismic <laughs> signals and uh, do some what we call data assimilation and fusion. Uh, so we're taking a look at a bunch of these precursors and we're trying to tie them all together to some sort of cohesive units to give an idea of uh, the probability that an earthquake will occur at a specific location. So the problem, like Dr. Corley introduced, is the devastating natural disaster that are earthquakes. And basically, I mean, a very simple definition of an earthquake is that it's a, a sudden and violent uh, shaking of the ground that uh, basically causes movement, or that is caused by movement of the Earth's crust, uh, and it often uh, results in volcanic action as well. Um, and the outcomes of these events are obviously, like Dr. Borley said, the destruction of civilization and loss of life and property. Uh, so there's, we basically break down uh, earthquakes into three classes, as Josh mentioned already. Uh, the earthquake events, which is the violent shaking that uh, most of you were already familiar with. Uh, but we also look at seismic events and pre-seismic events, uh, which actually occur prior to an earthquake. Uh, so seismic events uh, are basically tectonic plate motion. So in the crust of the earth, there are large rocks uh, that meet at what we call fault lines. And they sort of move along each other. And that small movement tends to build up over time and create what we call seismic activity. As this seismic activity builds up, uh, it can produce an earthquake. So the next class of signals uh, that we are primarily interested in are pre-seismic signals. And these are signals that occur uh, hours to days or potentially even months before an, an earthquake event actually happens. And these are the signals that we believe are the most promising for aiding in earthquake forecasting. So over the last hundred years, uh, there have been various kind of pre-seismic signals that have been observed. Uh, these include changes in water chemistry near fault lines, changes in air chemistry, uh, changes in the ionosphere with, in what we call total electron content, which you'll hear about later today. Uh, magnetic field anomalies, so basically just kind of strange changes in the Earth's magnetic field that happen around fault lines. Uh, low frequency tremors, which are basically like foreshocks or smaller earthquake events that happen before a major earthquake as well as uh, ground currents and surface potentials, which are things that are generated as a result of a rock being under stress. And what you see in these uh, diagrams here is uh, sort of a pictorial representation of a few of these precursors. So this one represents magnetic field precursors. Uh, we also have ground currents uh, through uh, some NASA research. And just a simplistic overview of sort of the main shock of an earthquake versus these low frequency tremors that happen beforehand that we're trying to look at. So in the end goal, we want to take all of these pre-seismic signals and collect them into some sort of central platform where we can analyze them as one cohesive unit rather than separate signals. So our theory is that any one of these uh, seismic signals can lie to you at any given time, but if all of them are pointing to the same thing, then there's a pretty good chance that that's pointing to an earthquake. Uh, so we'd like to invite up uh, James Bennett to talk about the first one of these uh, pre-seismic signals. Hello everyone, I'm James Bennett, and I've been investigating building a magnetometer to detect these magnetic field precursors. Uh, for this outline, I'll be talking about the problem we're looking for, the system requirements of the system that I'm building, current solutions, things that people have already done to solve these problems, methodology that we're following, results that we got, 
limitations of our methodology and what we'll be doing in the future. So the problem, there are magnetic earthquake precursors on the order of five nanotesla, uh, small spikes in the Earth's magnetic field that uh, have been observed by various researchers. And these happen uh, days and weeks before an earthquake uh, and only really occur within 30 kilometers of the epicenter of the earthquake. So we'd like to be able to detect these with fairly inexpensive device so that we can put them within 30 kilometers of every possible epicenter point, which is all points near fault. So the system that we're building shall be able to detect any magnetic field changes to within one nanotesla, which is quite small. The Earth's magnetic field is about 40 to 60 microtesla, which is four magnitudes, and four orders of magnitude greater. The system shall record data at no less than 10 samples a second. The system shall cost no more than $200 per unit. Hopefully we can get it a lot less than that. That's what we're paying for. The system shall require no more than 200 milliwatts of power. So what's been done so far? Last summer, Caleb and Josh uh, did some work investigating a fluxgate magnetometer uh, with limited success, but they uh, did a lot of the groundwork looking through the literature to support what we did this summer. Also, a company called Quakefinder has already been working on this. They've got magnetometers all up and down the faults in California. Uh, and some in Chile. The thing is, their magnetometer units cost around 50 grand a piece. So that's not good for what we're doing. So what I'll be, what I tried to work on this summer is building a flux gate magnetometer. Since these things tend to be rather small, uh, measure the magnitude of the end of the magnetic fields compared to others which measure only direction uh, or changes therein. Uh, literature in indicates that it should have a, magnitude, a resolution of one nanotesla, which is what we're looking for. And uh, this is a brief overview of how it works. So a flux gate magnetometer is basically a transformer that's operating outside of the ideal range. A transformer is uh, two coils uh, with connected to circuits that are connected be a magnetic flux in a core, uh, usually ferrite or some high permeability material. So the mag the, a current is put through the one coil, which induces a magnetic field in the core, core which then induces a current in the other coil, uh, proportional to the number of turns. Now, this really only works within a certain range. If you get outside that range, if you keep adding more current to the primary coil, you stop getting more magnetic flux. In the in the core because it saturates as you can see here this is the linear range where the transformer usually works but it reaches saturation here and here when you get more uh, current the flux gate magnetometer deliberately works in this region so that we can introduce harmonics to the output uh, so anomalies basically so what we're putting into the magnetometer, what we're putting into the primary coil, is a sine wave like this. The power spectrum density of this, which is indicates the amplitude of it at different frequencies, looks like a single spike because the sine wave, uh, the sine wave just has one frequency. However, when we, we drive it to saturation, or when we see magnetic fields, we'll see it becomes not sinusoidal anymore. In fact, it has harmonics. As you can see here, we have a spike and then a second spike at double frequency. That's the second harmonic. This is what we'll be looking for for our to indicate the, mag, the magnitude of the ambient magnetic field. The magnitude of that second harmonic should be proportional to the magnitude of the ambient magnetic field. So uh, the presence of an ambient magnetic field will speed the core to saturation because it just adds a bit more flux in there, which will increase the so the prototype I built this summer is based on a paper from RHR Laboratories, which is unfortunately defunct now. It involves uh, two ferrite cores, which are shaped like tubes 
with the drive coil, the primary one that was driving, going through the center of the tubes, and the secondary coil, or the sense coil, going around the outside. Here's a picture of the device. It is beautiful. <laughs> we built that ourselves. Uh, it has two tube-shaped cores, which you can't see right now. Drive coil is nine turns through the center. You can see that sticking out the ends. And which is driven at 19 volts peak to peak at 22 kilohertz, which is pretty high frequency. We had some problems with that one. The sense coil, which you can see here being lovely and perfect, is 1,200 turns around the outside. And the output voltage from that coil is read and recorded in lab. So uh, the signal analysis that we did in the lab to get the information that we actually wanted out of this, uh, we put a bandpass filter on the signal we got from the set from the sense coil around 44 kilohertz, which it should be the second harmonic for the drive filter. The is 22 kilohertz, half of that. Uh, we also, after that, put an RMS unit, which gives us the average power of it. We don't want that wild 44 kilohertz sine wave. We just want a number to show how what the amplitude is. And that was sent to a graph. Power spectrum density of the entire signal was also sent to a graph, so we could see that spike at 22 kilohertz, the drive frequency, and another one at 44. Our the root mean square, the average power, temperature, and time were all recorded to a file for later plotting and analysis. So uh, this is a brief demo of my setup. Uh, we'll see if it works. Uh, basically, what happens here is the in red you can see the magnetometer, and I'm waving a magnet around here. And this big box on the center of the screen shows the RMS of the voltage of the, 20, the 44 kilohertz signal out of the magnetometer. And you can see it changes when the magnet moves, depending on the position of the magnet, which is uh, indicatory of how much of the magnetic field of the magnet is parallel to the device. It only senses magnetic field along the axis of the device itself. Look here, we get uh, quite significant changes, which are uh, quite high above the noise level. But all this is below 15 uh, uh, millivolts. Yes, millivolts. So uh, our testing setup is like so. We have the sensor itself, which is powered by a function generator, running at 19 volts per feet, 22 kilohertz. Uh, a DC power supply powering a very large coil, which we use to generate a known magnetic field, so we know what magnetic field we were sensing, so we could calibrate it. And a thermometer, just because the literature indicates that there should be some temperature dependence of this device. And all these things were connected up to live view via the MIDAT, which is output to a commissary value file, which we can pop later. Here you can see the setup. Uh, here's the solenoid. The sensor itself is in there. You can sort of see the wires coming up. Here's a top level view, which is a bit easier to see. See, the sensor is inside this box here. The coil that we're generating a magnetic field with is here, powered by the DC power supply. The sensor is powered by this function generator here. And these are the interfaces to the computer in yellow. The thermometer is up here. And this is the data we got out. Uh, we can see that as the magnetic field increases, this is uh, determined through by measuring the voltage that we put into the solenoid and calculating what the magnetic field should be. As the magnetic field increases, the voltage at the second harmonic increases in a sort of um, x squared curve. And you can see here, this dip here, is right where you'd expect the magnitude of the Earth's magnetic field to be at uh, around 50 microtesla. So this is the equation I used to calculate what the magnetic field should be for that chart. Uh, B is the magnetic field strength. U is the magnetic permeability of the core. I assume that was the magnetic permeability of the air, since the magnetometer shouldn't change that so much since it's being driven to saturation. N is the churn density. These uh, coils were each 3,400 turns and 10 centimeters long, so it's simple to calculate that. And I was the current of the coil, which we can determine from the voltage that was in the coil and the known resistance thereof. 
We also did some tests to determine whether the core was actually going into saturation, because that's very important for the operation of this device. So we connected the input and output, the sense coil and the drive coil, both to an oscilloscope and plotted them against each other. So the one axis here is, is the voltage from the sense coil, and the other axis is the voltage we're putting into the drive coil. And you can see that at low voltages, around 12 volts peak to peak, we have this perfect ellipse, which indicates that they're both sinusoidal and they're both they're a bit out of phase from each other. But when we increase the voltage to around 19 volts peak to peak, which is what, where we were operating, the ellipse is truncated at the ends, which indicates that one of the signals is not sinusoidal anymore, the sense signal, and thus that it is the core is indeed reaching saturation. There is a perfect passage anymore. And we actually saw this ellipse start to get truncated around 16 volts peak to peak, which indicates we're well into saturation and should be getting so some limitation of, of our methodology right now. Power requirements. Uh, the drive signal that we're putting in is 90 volts peak to peak and 22 kilohertz. That's rather difficult to produce in the field, especially since the paper by RHR Laboratories that we base this off of suggests 28 volts peak to peak at the same frequency, which we couldn't even get in the lab since our amplifiers couldn't bring the voltage from the function generator up to that level. Also, resolution limitations. Current resolution that we've observed of the magnitude is lower than required. Although that could just be because we haven't been able to filter out all the noise. As you see, the, the best thing we measured was the Earth's magnetic field, which is on the order of 50 microtesla, four orders of magnitude higher than what we're looking for. Uh, literature indicates, and also preliminary investigation, that the resolution of this device, how sensitive it is, depends greatly on the magnitude of the drive voltage here. So increasing that would make our thing work a good bit better. So for the future, we're going to continue to develop this prototype, build a de dedicated power supply for the signal that we can deploy in the field, and dedicated am amplification and filtering for the output signal. Notice all the signal analysis was done in LabVIEW. We can't bring those computers to hate. So we'll need to be able to, we'll need to build hardware to do all that for us. So what, what I've been thinking for that is an AMD modulator to pull out the magnitude of the 44 kilohertz signal. Uh, Dr. Connelly has been helping me with some potential designs for that. We'd also like to investigate other designs, uh, alternate flux gate designs. The geometry of the core uh, can greatly change the utility of the device. And last year, Josh and Caleb investigated a couple other geometries with limited success, but we'd like to look into others. Also, we'd like to look into another design entirely, the inductance magnetometer. This is what plate finder is using. Uh, again, theirs are very expensive, but we could probably build a cheaper. I'd just like to acknowledge a few people before I go to questions. Uh, Austin Heron uh, worked with me for much of this uh, project over the summer. Unfortunately, he had to go back to Colorado, so he can't be with us today. Uh, Kilo Batchel and Josh Loisen uh, got this work started last summer and were great help with getting us access to the literature. Uh, Dr. Cornley, of course, for setting all this up and his continued advice and help in understanding the operation of the flux gate, which is rather tricky. And of course, Eastern Nazarene College for providing us the funding and the space to do all this work. Any questions? Please. What do you think is your biggest source of error? I believe this today. Our biggest source of error right now is that we don't actually know what all the ambient magnetic field is. We're in an environment with a lot of computers and people walking around metal tables, et cetera, which all introduces noise to the signal. And we can't cancel that out for our calibration measurements. Ideally, we'd have some house that's 500 years old in the middle of nowhere that we'd be able to set up our test equipment in. But we can't do that. Other questions for James? 
are there any like factors that would produce the result of an earthquake that would, that would complicate like confounding factors some third well cause? uh quake finder has done a lot of uh, investigation into that and the things that could potentially give you false uh, signals are like lightning strikes, cars driving by, and those are all very distinctive. And also, uh, large scale things, you can just tell if it's showing up at multiple magnetometers because you'll have several in the area. So, yes, there are things, but they're not difficult to filter out. And how, how would the devices communicate? Right now, I think you're recording on a hard drive. Yeah, it's. Right? And then I'm assuming you'd go look at like the history. But yeah, so we'll actually touch on that later in the presentation when we talk about the data collection. Yeah, that's outside my realm. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? All right, thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Andres Biondi, and before I start, I want to thank you everyone to be here because you guys came here and to give us your support and this summer research that we work hard to. So today I'm going to talk to you about the seismic stress precursor, and I'm going to give you some update about what we found uh, since I present this on for my senior design, and then we actually found some interesting results that we didn't think it would correct, but. I'm going to explain a little bit on. So I'm going to give you an overview. I'm going to give you some introduction, what I'm looking into. I'm also going to talk to you about uh, some earthquakes and the type of rocks that we can find in the earth crust. Then I'm going to go into the tier of rocks under stress. And then uh, I will show you the experiment that I performed here and the results that we obtained. All right, so for introduction, we want to, there were three things that we would like to do, we wanted to do when, uh, by performing this experiment. The first one is uh, to see what was the behavior of the rock on the stress. The second one to uh, study the electro property of the rocks. And the third one is what, uh, how well or what was the fidelity of the observation that we obtained. Right. So the property of the rocks. So as Dr. Cohen mentioned, uh, when an earthquake happens, it usually occurs on 99% in the earth crust. The earth crust is, uh, is formed of different types of minerals and rocks. Mainly, the rocks that we found is the igneous rock. As you can see, there are three types of rocks. So we have the metamorphic rocks, which are formed when sedimentary or igneous rocks are exposed to high temperatures. Then we have the igneous rock, which are formed by melted rock that has cooled down with basically when the magma is uh, mixed together so with uh, minerals and then solidified. And then uh, we have the sedimentary rocks, which are formed uh, from layers of accumulation of fragment of rocks, minerals, animals, or plants. As I mentioned before, uh, the majority of the rocks found in the earth crust are igneous. And these igneous rock, rocks can have some type of properties that when put under strength, it will allow them to kind of create a electro, electron flow and a change of current. All right, so uh, when I did this presentation the first time, we were believing that the reason why the rocks uh, we're producing this uh, change, uh, this uh, movement of electron. It was because we thought that the rocks were behaving as a piece of electron material. And we found out later on, thanks to Dr. Freeman, he gave us uh, a presentation, and we found out that we was actually wrong. But this was not the reason why we, uh, why the uh, there was some type of electricity or current moving when the rocks were alive. So, uh, so just to give you a little bit uh, knowledge about what the piezoelectric materials uh, behave is. Uh, so we have a uh, a material in this case will be the rock. So when we apply a stress, which we have a pulling axis, when we apply the when we apply a stress, this eventually will compress the, uh, the the rock and it will allow them to break the bonds and then to create a uh, type of semiconductor behavior and then we will see uh, some type of movement. However, uh, let me move forward here. So this is also when we apply a voltage into the rock, it will eventually expand the rock. So that's what the idea what we have at the beginning. However, we uh, talked to Dr. Friedman and he told us because uh, he tells that 
this behavior was due to the uh, uh, to the piezoelectric effect. If not, it was to the what he calls the, pre the presence of mobile charge carriers referred to as positive impulse. Basically, he made he did some studies about um, the change of peroxy bonds into the rock that eventually will lead to this flow of electrons. So to be able to understand this, um, there is a lot of thermodynamics and physics and physical chemistry we have to go under. So it was kind of difficult to understand because uh, we haven't reached to the level where we uh, will be able to understand the behavior of the chemistry with the physical. So I'm gonna give you a small presentation of how the rock will behave once the uh, once the, uh, the, uh, the force is applied to the rock. So what are peroxid defects? Peroxids in the rocks, when they are getting in contact, when, that, when the igneous rock are formed, they get in contact with water. And this water, the, the molecular water, will create a peroxid into the uh, structure of the crystallization of the rock. So once the, uh, once the rock is compressed, this peroxid bonds will break and it will create uh, I will call an insulator with periodic defect disassociation. So this means that the energy bands, so the energy bands that we have here when the, uh, there is, sorry, let me just give you a background before actually going on to here. So they, uh, the rocks will behave as a semiconductor. There are different type of, uh, of uh, materials that, that are known as a semiconductor. So we have the, the ones that are here, the valence band, which will eventually uh, when it will release an electron, it will go into a conductive band and it will allow the flow of electron. Then we have what we call an insulator, and they, for the insulator, the band gap is so high that the electron will not be able to reach to the other side, so eventually it will not allow the flow of a current. Then we have what we call the insulator with peroxy bond defects, and this is on, on dissociated, which means that the peroxy bond has to be broken, so at, at that moment, the rock is not conducting any type of electricity. However, when the bond is break, it will create two different energy levels, and in, and in this energy level, it will allow the electrons to jump because the gap between the conductive band and, uh, and the valence band is smaller now, so it will allow the electron to have a, a, a jump from this band to the other one, which will create a flow of current. So that was eventually the theory that we uh, allowed us to understand what was happening. Uh, the way how Dr. Friedman developed this theory, we, he used uh, magnesium oxide. He actually uh, created this magnesium oxide, adding all the type of all the type of minerals. And he did two part experiment. The first one was by uh, putting this magnesium oxide to high temperatures, and this is what will help him to come up with the theory of periodic bonds. Uh, he used our IR infrared spectroscopy, spectroscopy, ah, spectroscopy to be able to uh, see the structure of the crystal. And then using the same theory that he did by analyzing the magnesium oxide, he went on into a second part of the experiment, which was, was applying the stress into the rock. So basing on what he uh, what he told us and what we have read from his paper. We, we uh, dropped the idea that the rock was behaving as a piezoelectric uh, material, and then we'll move on into a new area, which is uh, the peroxys effect. He even called this uh, this type of semiconductor an uh, epiconductor transition. All right, so here's an experiment that the NASA present. So they use a gravel rock over here, uh, and then the way how this works, he used two Two, two electrodes at the end, at the, uh, each edge of the rock. Then he used a uh, hydraulic press, and by the time he was compressing the hydraulic press, it would create a flow of electrons, which will move through to the, to the instruments that you can find here, which is the animators and the volumeters. And this one will pick up the change, uh, the change in the electric field uh, and, and the current of the rock. So here's the result that they that they present. Uh, on the left side, we have the current, uh, and on the right side, we have the, uh, the, uh, the amount of loads that's being applied. Uh, so you can see as the uh, load is increasing, the change in current also jumps, which will give us an estimate or an idea that when rocks are compressed, which happens when the, uh, when an earthquake is, is occurring because we have high amount of stress put into the rock, there will eventually be some type of uh, current 
generated, which we can predict, because this scooter will travel all the way to the surface, and this will be allowed to have some type of magnetic field change. It will allow to have some type of electric, uh, total electron content change in the atmosphere. So basically, this will be the origin of all the signals that we eventually can use to predict uh, uh, an earthquake. So here's uh, some, like a, kind of like a little bit of simulation how it works. So we have the rocks. So in the rock, we have all type of materials. We have all type of uh, electrons and, and protons. All, all are in, uh, in balanced states. So when we apply the force, these electrons will uh, separate and then will create what we call a semiconductor. And eventually, if we are able to uh, connect it into a circle, we have a flow of a current, and that current will allow us to measure the amount of current that we are generating by compressing the rock. So in the ENC experiment setup, we use uh, different type of materials. And the idea was to try to uh, create an experiment that was as expensive as it was for NASA. So we did our best to uh, acquire some type of instrument that was under the under 2000. So the most expensive thing was the pico anemeter, and we needed this because uh, this pico anemeter has a uh, connection directly into the computer and allows to process all the data. Then we have a hydraulic press, and this hydraulic press can go up to 10 tons. Uh, unfortunately, I will tell you later about the uh, the problems that we run into. Uh, this um, this uh, hydraulic press wasn't good enough, and I will tell you the reasons later why. Then we have a high power voltage supplies, and this was used uh, to be able to apply a voltage to the rock and to be able to reduce the amount of noise that's created and to have a base voltage. Uh, and then we have the my DAC, which is a uh, DAC data acquisition, and then we use some type of BNC cable, which allows to reduce the amount of noise that's picked up by the engine. Right. So before I went on into uh, trying the experiment with the rock, I um, I did a, a ground test because we need to find a good ground that allows to see that once we do all the connection, it will work. Okay, so here in this picture, you can see the top one is a high power supply. Uh, this one is a really, really old uh, uh, peak one meter uh, in the 60s. So we changed from this and we moved to a new one. Uh, this is the peak one meter, and then these are all their power supplies. And, um, and uh, this is a voltmeter. So in this table, we have a, a small circuit with a 1K resistor. And what we did was to we apply a current, a voltage to the circuit, and then we eventually obtain the data. And then if by doing arm slope, if the result by applying voltage over current, the slope of that will be equal to the uh, to the resistance that we applied, that we used to, and then you can see it's around 1K, 1,050, uh, which is roughly 1K. So then we move on in to do another experiment before uh, moving to the rock, and then we, do, we use PSO electric materials. And the reason why we did this, we wanted to see what effect will have the applied voltage into the uh, element to see if we, it will damage it or it will see what we will see. So what we did was uh, we took the piezo electric material and this piezo material electric material is once you bend it, uh, you will be able to have a generation of current. So we apply a voltage to it and then we proceed to the same experiment and this is the result that we found. So uh, this is the baseline, which we'll call a control test. This is the voltage, that, the current that, we, that we, is generated when a uh, voltage is applied. So the second graph on the right is the, uh, is the result that we obtain once we apply the voltage to the piezo electric material and then we bend it. As you can see, there is a change. Once, once we bend the material, there is a change of a roughly 2.6 million. From, there's a drop from 2.6 to 2.3 million. So that tells us that by applying the base current, we can actually see precisely if there will be any change on the current once uh, once we do it into the rock. All right. So here's a picture of the uh, of the whole system. Uh, so we have a rock. We use aluminum foil at the edges of the rock uh, as a as a anode as a as an anode to be able to apply the voltage. Uh, and the bottom is what we call a uh, it's a voltage divider. And the reason why we did this is because the uh, my DAC assistant can only read up to 10 volts. 
So we need, and we will apply around 100 volts. So we needed to break this voltage down so we can be able to observe what are the voltages that we're putting into. Uh, and then uh, here's the uh, here's the the MATLAB code. So eventually, what this does is we obtain the data. This data is moved into LabVIEW, and one in, once in LabVIEW, it will write into a file, and that file will be sent into MATLAB. And MATLAB will, is in charge of uh, the code that we, I wrote in MATLAB will actually pull all this data. So here's a picture of what the uh, spreadsheet in uh, in LabVIEW looks like. Uh, so these ones are, uh, oh, this one's, oh yeah, this three from here to here is all current. So I was taking eight data points per second, and the last two is equal to the, uh, one is the voltage divider uh, that we measured, and the other one is actually the actual the value that is being put into from the uh, uh, voltage supplier. All right, so as we did before, we run the same, we ran the same experiments, we apply a voltage to the rock and we create a control test. And this is eventually the control test that we obtain. Okay, when, once, when we apply a 100 voltage, we obtain a, a baseline current of around 0.32 nanoamps. All right. So uh, starting, uh, starting with a baseline of 0.33 nanoamps, uh, we start applying uh, tonnage of pressure into the rock. Uh, this graph will show us that uh, once we apply one ton, you can see the baseline it starts around here, which is uh, 0.03 nanoamps, and then we see, sorry, it starts around 0.33 nanoamps, and then we have a jump of 0.03 nanoamps. So once we apply the tonnage, uh, we can see that the current generated goes up to this top and it saturates, and then when we release it, it goes back to the baseline. So this tells us that uh, when we apply the pressure, there will be some type of signal generation into the rock. So we did the same experiment. Uh, we went to two tons, three tons, uh, four tons, and up to five, uh, five tons. And we actually see the same behavior on each one. So uh, unfortunately, uh, when we get to five tons, we realize that, well, doc, uh, Dr. Freeman tells us that the rocks are actually really complicated because once you are stressed at one time, it will not have the same property if you try it again. So you have to leave the rock sitting for a couple, not a couple, for a few hours, and let the rock rest so it can go back to its original properties. So we didn't know that, so we just, I just went on and ran all the experiment at the same time. And of course, uh, you can see there is no correlation between the baseline, and the reason is because uh, I made a mistake. And he even told us that he made the same mistake, and he realized after six months of working on that, the rocks were behaving as their own thing, so you need to let them rest. So that's why sometimes this type of experiment it takes too long to realize because of all the moment, all the time that you have to wait, and all the things that you have to go through to be able to acquire the results. All right. So for the results that we obtained, we analyzed the behavior of a piece of granite, and this actually this granite was actually. From Quincy, we took them from the uh, RIAS facilities to see if there are any type of rocks left over that they don't use. And uh, we went to a uh, place around here that allows us to cut up and to have a, almost a perfect rectangle. Uh, the result that we obtained are quite promising. We can see there is something in there that changed because we see the jumps. Uh, however, we will need to do further investigation to, to, to try to obtain a more precise uh, values. Um, also, we see that the magnitude of the current is proportional to the pressure. The more, the more pressure that we apply, the higher the, uh, the, the, the gap between the baseline and the current uh, that is uh, generated. And then, most important thing, we try, we kind of replicate to try uh, the uh, NASA Ames experiment. And of course, we use less amount of money. Uh, they will be uh, eventually for future work. Uh, we would like to improve the experiment setup. And the main reason is that the, the hydraulic press that we use it is a hydraulic press that is meant to work on, a, on a car shops or on a wood shops. So it's not meant to hold pressure. So eventually, once you use it a long time, it will not give you the precise result, the precise tonnage that even the gauge is with. The gauge can tell you it's five tons, but it, we don't know if that is correct. And the reason is because once we leave it, uh, for multiple time in uh, uh, putting pressure into the rock, 
uh, the oil will start losing out of this cylinder and start going to the gauge. So that gives us an, uh, an idea that the, uh, pre the hydraulic press is not working correctly. So eventually we would like to get a, hyd a hydraulic press that is uh, really, like it can give us a really precise value and it's meant to this experiment. Uh, we would like to uh, uh, investigate potential second order effects of seismoelectric behavior of rock under stress so, such as change in temperature. Uh, and this is because we believe that once we, all the peroxide bonds are broken, uh, if, I'm not, if I'm mistaken or to, you can correct me, but due to uh, thermodynamics, there will be some type of release of energy, and that energy will uh, kind of affect the temperature of the rock. Uh, then we'll be lead, uh, we would like to make some uh, investigate what are the potential second order effects into the uh, magnetic field that James was working on. Right. Do you guys have any questions about this? You said the size of the jump was proportional to the yeah to the, to the so the higher you can see so here's the baseline so in this graph we apply one ton and you can see the jump is is around 0.03 nanometer so on the second graph we went up and we applied two tons and then now you can see that the jump between the baseline and the top is around 0.06 nanowatt and eventually. So when we get here is uh, when we start running in trouble and then we believe that at this point the rock is already saturated. So at that moment we need to let it rest and we didn't know that. So that's probably why uh, between four and five tons we have kind of the same, we have the same jump. So that's why we believe that uh, if the more pressure you put, the higher will be the jump between the baseline of the voltage that we apply uh, to the ones I generated. And the reason why we use this system is because the amount of current that is generated through the rock is so small that any type of noise can affect it. So we want to create some type of uh, like control test that we can see, well, this is not as much noise because we know this is, this is correct. Anything that's above it is something that is generated extra. So that's why we create this. Any other question? When you uh, when you actually made the measurement of the piezo electric field, did you send it like this? Yeah. So that was a, that's uh, there's different type of piezo electric materials. The one that I, I had it was uh, used by other student in another uh, senior design, and that type of piezo electric material was a uh, bent piezo electric material because the way how he was using it, he was putting it into uh, some type of charging system where you can just tap it and it will create a, uh, a current it will charge a battery of a phone. So this one was uh, a painting piece of electric material. Like yeah, you bend it like this. And the other one on the granite? Uh, no, we didn't use one in the granite. So the granite was the rock by itself and then we compress it. What was the question? But how did you measure the piezoelectric field? The current? We'll go back to oh, you. So the graph, yeah. So go on back one. one more. This one, yeah. Yeah. So this is the one you're flexing like. Yes, this. that's the one, yeah. And now in the other graphs, then what are you comparing the currents? The currents coming from? From the rock. Rock itself. The rock itself, this one here. Yeah. Rock itself. I was trying to think of somebody you have. You don't trust that number, probably 0.03, but you, you have a typical value. I was trying to uh, see if you could tell, if you could do a calculation on, is that a reasonable value by uh, by determining uh, how much it compressed? Is it on the atomic level or not? So, oh, okay, I see. Okay. Uh, well, we didn't go into, because we thought at the beginning was, Due to piezoelectric materials, we didn't go into atomic level. Yeah. And there's actually, you have to go into atomic level to be able to understand what the production bond is occurring. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about <clears throat> is when you compress it, what is actually the movement, how much movement is there? Oh, from the and comparing that to. Okay, <clears throat> so. Yeah. We didn't have, you yeah. About, you, so you mean, you mean like one compressive rock, it was any type of movement of the rock? 
Like yeah, we, we, we get shorter. Well, that would, yeah. Uh, but we didn't come yeah. from the other direction. So. We will have to think about how to do that uh, because it's always a piece of rock and kind of hard to see how much is being compressed from the rock. So, so the piece of information missing. This baseline that you've got here, how did you get it? Oh, this baseline I got it by, uh, by applying a uh, voltage into the rock. Right. So this is the this is the baseline. So there was a thought is a to yeah. initially to get that baseline yeah. and then you question and then you press the rod and then you see that. the jump here. Yeah. So that's what we have this picture. We start we start with a control test of finding hundred volts, and this is the baseline that we obtain. And then after that we had that we move on into applying the stress into the rock and then we have the different type of jumps. Yeah. More questions for interest? Any other questions? Would you impact from the baseline if there is any wave effect from ground vibrations versus the actual voltage applied to the rock? Well, we have the, the way how we uh, have this set up, it was pretty steady, so we didn't have as much vibration. Uh, and uh, like I say, this is not more at this. The study of this type of behavior is no more a piezoelectric behavior. So we have to go into the atomic level to be able to understand. So uh, I didn't have a much vibration. I, I wouldn't have a way to compare it. The point was some, but I made sure that the system was kind of steady and didn't have any type of outside influence. And what was the decision to use 100 volts? Uh, well, it's because if you go, if you do lower voltage, okay, the peak one meter will be able to reach to read it. So I use a hundred volt because it was the most steady that I observed. I tried different ones, and then that was the most steady uh, value that I obtained for the baseline. So would there be any merit to going to higher voltages to generate more current? I will have to take. Well, I believe so. We'll have to take a look into that and see if uh, what will be the. Uh, and also, we have the limitation of the high power supplies. Um, um, it's a DC voltage, yeah. So the AC voltage gives you better results for transmission? I think. Probably. However, we don't have an AC high power supplies in the lab, so that's one of the reasons why. You got, you got magnet wire transformers over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, well, eventually we have another, it's another experiment that we try to run. Uh, and we were requiring a high power supply of AC. We had really trouble, a lot of trouble trying to amplify the signal. So, all right, let me take the time at this stage here. Forgot to do that at the beginning. Um, we do have quite a bit of people watching this live, and I want to uh, acknowledge their presence and thank them for joining us, particularly Dr. Friedman Fun, if you're out there. You're gonna see your name being being called throughout this presentation. So we thank you for joining us. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nicholas Burke. I'm Joel Vicky. Uh, we're gonna be talking to you a bit about our work in an attempt to model the water chemistry changes that are expected uh, from these kinds of activity. So first we're going to talk a little bit about the problem of uh, water chemistry measurements specifically. We're going to discuss some of the background, more of a uh, biologist or chemist point of view of the peroxy defects. We'll then go into the work that's been accomplished by the lab over the last few summers, some of the limitations that we derive from that work and how we apply those to the methodology that we are currently using. Uh, we'll then discuss some of the results from that work, our conclusions, and the work that we so, as already has been discussed, we are aware that igneous rocks, specifically, uh, have been shown to generate current when put under a certain quantity of mechanical stress. Uh, this is particularly pertinent to our field, as we know that the tectonic plates are composed of igneous rocks, such as granite and basalt. Uh, what this tells us is that those charge carriers that are generated due to these peroxy defects uh, not only propagate through the rock and through those granules, but are able to reach the surface of the rock and therefore interact with air uh, or with the surrounding water. Now, whereas a decent amount of work has been done looking at the water chemistry changes, such as pH, conductivity, and ion concentrations following seismic activity, uh, very little work has been done looking at the actual pre-seismic water chemistry changes that occur leading up to an earthquake. And any sort of insight into those changes would be very helpful for earthquake forecasting and prediction. 
Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about peroxy defects from a chemistry standpoint. Um, so peroxy is when there are two oxygens bound together. Uh, it's not very stable and um, it's caused in these crystals when the magma is cooled in the presence of water. Uh, the oxygen gets trapped in a place it normally wouldn't be and then there you have the unstable peroxy bond there in the crystal. Um, is it turned on? So here's a little image of what the crystal looks like. Uh, there you see there is a peroxy bond happening right here. There's an extra oxygen that's bound a little differently than the rest of them. Uh, so when the mechanical action of the earthquake happens, these break uh, and cause a radical uh, oxygen that needs an electron. So it'll steal it from a, a neighboring, uh, neighboring oxygen, which then that becomes a, a radical and that wants to steal an electron. So you can see how this would propagate in all different directions throughout the whole rock. Uh, there's millions and millions of these little bonds happening inside of the rocks at the tectonic plates. So this can propagate far and wide and with a good amount of power. So like Andre said, uh, we know about these proxy defects and their uh, propagation because of the work of Dr. Freeman Coyne. Um, so from a chemistry point of view, as we look at it, you can sort of see the graphic here in which you're producing oxygen radicals. Uh, they have the absence of an electron, or as you can call it, an electron hole. Uh, in this field, referred to as a positive hole. Uh, in that case, they are in need of filling that positive hole so they will steal electrons from surrounding oxygens. And instead of a traditional current of electrons, uh, you get electrons flowing backward to fill those holes, and you actually get a propagation of p-holes through this rock. Uh, those p-holes are not only just able to leave the granule, but they can leave um, that entire part of the rock and exit into the surrounding substance. Uh, we know because of work that Dr. Friedman et al. performed in 2011 that um, this can actually lead to the production of hydrogen peroxide in surrounding bodies of water. Um, we just we know that that is work that he has done. However, we believe that it's also possible that if you have charge carriers entering that water, uh, you can have interaction with organic molecules and other uh, ions that could lead to changes in pH and conductivity. So those are what we'd like to explore. Uh, additionally, since all of this is framed in the mind of we want to be able to build a cheap probe in order to detect these, uh, changes in pH and conductivity are very cheap and easy to detect, whereas in order to detect changes uh, or additions of hydrogen peroxide, uh, you need much larger uh, spectrophotometers to be able to detect that. Whereas even the production of hydrogen peroxide is actually known to interfere with pH probes and other probes dependent on potential differences. So using a structure like we're hoping to use, we can even monitor those changes. Uh, so here's another picture of Andres' work from last year. Uh, our original hopes were to combine water chemistry and the uh, earthquake um, machine here that he made together last year. Um, so we didn't get to do that right away because we both sort of split ways and did our own little projects. Andres got his results that you just saw. He created currents by pressing the rock. Um, I went off to do my own experiment where I simulated this. Um, there are papers before that said that 25 millivolts came out of pressed uh, granite. So I took that and I applied that through the rock, a piece of granite uh, similar to the one that uh, Andreas had, into a pool of water that I collected from the pond down the road. Um, I had it constantly stirring so that there wouldn't be any sort of interference from some uh, probe sitting in the same amount of water for an extended amount of time or anything like that. Um, I applied the voltage at two hour increments. Uh, it would be two hours of voltage, then two hours of rest, then two hours of voltage, two hours of rest. Uh, and I recorded temperature, conductivity, and pH data uh, the whole time I ran the experiment, which lasted for 46 hours. Uh, here is the control. Um, the scale is a little bit deceiving. The temperature didn't vary very much. It looks like a big jump, but you can see it's only about a couple degrees. Uh, we did some statistical analysis recently and found that there was no correlation between temperature change and pH change in our experiments. Uh, here is my results with uh, the voltages. Uh, so as you can see, every time there's a voltage applied here, there is an immediate drop in pH 
Uh, and then when the voltage is released, then it goes back up to where it actually is and continues to increase. Uh, the drop is actually due to instrument error from reading the voltage from, that's being applied. Um, that could be useful because we know that these voltages come out of these rocks when there's pressure. So if we see a huge drop with our pH sensor, then we know there might be a, something happening in the earth. Uh, next, we'll see. Uh, that's all of the, the low points where the voltages are constant at 25 millivolts. Um, and here is the peaks uh, with the voltage drops removed. You can see there's a great increase in pH over time uh, as compared to the control, which was basically uh, no change. So, so as of yet, what we know from these two experiments, which were both performed last summer, is that um, we are capable of repeating the work of NASA. We can uh, generate current from applying mechanical stress to these rocks, and that in some way, shape, or form, the propagation of charge carriers through this rock is able to affect the water chemistry in some way that we can measure. Uh, but what we need to be able to do moving forward from this point is combine those experiments. We need to be able to show that actually applying mechanical stress to this rock can cause a measurable change in water that is in contact with this rock. So from all the work that's been done, we've learned a number of equipment limitations that we need to be able to adhere to for all the work that we did uh, this summer. So first of those, we know Andres already discussed the limitations of the hydraulic press. Uh, we knew that there was not only a limited compression time, uh, that work generally happened within 100 seconds. Uh, that's not generally a uh, time frame in which you're going to see dramatic changes in pH, so we needed to be able to push that over the summer to see just how long we could maintain compression. However, we also know that there is some pressure uncertainty and possible saturation of the press. Uh, we don't have a gauge that's capable of telling us actually how much pressure is being applied to that rock. Uh, so throughout this, we need to accept that there is some uncertainty, even if our gauge is telling us that we are going up to five tons, we can't necessarily state that. All we have is the results that we produce after the fact. Uh, we also had limited usable granite samples. Uh, for the duration of our research, we had to stick with one rectangular um, piece of granite because the instruments necessary for actually obtaining another piece of granite and trimming it down to usable sizes are uh, just not things we can afford. And if you try to put a rugged piece of granite under the press, it will be flying. Um, additionally, there was some uncertainty about the properties of the peroxide defects that we discussed. Uh, thanks to Dr. Freund, we had a conversation, uh, which I already mentioned. Um, that we don't necessarily know the longevity of those peroxide defects, but we know that they reset in a way if you leave them be for a number of hours. So all the experiments that we performed were set apart by at least 24 hours to ensure that the rock was sitting and that those defects were not being triggered accidentally in between experimental trials. Finally, the sensors that we used uh, were vernier sensors used by our chemistry department. Um, one thing to notice is that they are all uh, potential difference dependent, so we have to be careful seeing as we are dealing with uh, moving charge carriers that we are not generating false data simply because there is a potential difference at some point in our system. So we had to keep a number of controls out to make sure we weren't getting false information. Uh, for the majority of the beginning of the summer, we had some issues uh, with calibration of those probes and actually had to purchase a new probe, which gave us much better results in terms of the results we'll be seeing today. Um, so like I said, the aim here uh, is to combine those experiments. So one of the first things we did was we used uh, water in a similar way that JT did for his experiments, which is very sensible. A lot of experiments that have to do with water chemistry precursors or in water chemistry will use a distilled or deionized water uh, for their tests, which as JT has pointed out, is not something to apply to groundwater or aquifers. So uh, for his experiments, we obtained uh, water from the local pond. Uh, in this case, we also vacuum filtered that water and did a 24-hour UV exposure session to make sure it was sterilized so there weren't any uh, microbial processes occurring while we were trying to take our measurements. Um, and finally, thanks to Andres, a water channel was drilled into that granite block. We figured having an actual channel, the dimensions of which you can see here, uh, would give us the maximum exposure to that water as opposed to just sitting it on. Um, and as you can see here, the volume that can be held by that channel is 24 milliliters, uh, although we used uh, slightly less than that to make sure we had room for our probes. Uh, so here is our experiment from this year. We have the same press there, as you can see. Uh, the, we used 21 milliliters of water because that way we can fit our temperature probe and either our pH or conductivity probes. Uh, we ran conductivity and pH run separately because there's only so much room in that little hole. Um, 
and we used wax paper to cover the hole. We were afraid of the evaporation of the water affecting our results in any way, so we wanted to rule that out completely by just covering it up so it couldn't really evaporate out. Uh, so for the first set of experiments, we uh, applied five or six tons to the rock uh, for about 30 seconds each, or for uh, two to five minutes, and then we gave 30 second rests in between uh, to, because we were afraid of breaking the press. Um, and here we have some of the results. Um, so one thing I guess we forgot to mention in case anybody would be concerned, there is a uh, plastic uh, insulator in between both the uh, bottom of the press and the top of the press, so the rock is not in contact with any metal in case that was a concern. Uh, but yeah, so for the majority of our trials at the uh, beginning of the summer, we were really trying to adhere to these, adhere to these equipment limitations that we knew about the hydraulic press. We didn't want to break the press or any of our sensors, so we spent a good portion of time attempting to adhere to those. Uh, here you have a pH graph and you can see the trend line is fairly straight, uh, slight increase, but not significant in terms of the other measurements that you've seen. Uh, with the temperature fairly constant, as you can see there, with no pressure being applied. Uh, the problem being, at least for our first set of experiments, all of the trials with pressure also looked like that. Um, with a very straight trend line, even though up to uh, six tons in this case was being applied for three minutes every 30 seconds. Um, so this is what the majority of our trials looked like when we were trying to stick with low pressure and uh, low exposure times. Like we said, we were only doing between two and five minutes of actual pressure and then relieving it to give the press a break. We just didn't want to break anything. Um, similar results were seen for conductivity, as you can see here, very constant trend line, both with and both without and with pressure. So in this case, even with six tons of pressure applied for five minutes every 30 seconds, uh, um, none of those results were seen. So. Only about three weeks ago at this point, we reached the point where we said in order to actually uh, see these changes, we're going to need to make some adjustments to our methodology. Uh, so JT suggested that what we should do is simply do what the tectonic plates are probably doing, apply pressure as high as we can actually get it with the press and just leave it for whatever period we could. A little risky, but it didn't break. Just so everybody knows in advance, everything's fine. <laughs> um, so in this case, while well, we were initially aiming to only apply five to six tons with the press, we actually brought the gauge up to the between six and ten tons. If you will recall, if there was some uncertainty with the press, we cannot be sure that that is exactly the level we were bringing it, but at least in appearance, uh, we brought it between six and ten tons. And instead of going with 100 seconds, we left it for anywhere between 40 and 60 minutes, uh, the data which you will see here. Uh, so here's our control with this new uh, idea. So we left it for 40 minutes. It was a pretty straight line. Uh, the variation was about 0 0.042. Uh, not very much. But when we looked at the data, when we applied the pressure for a greater amount of time, there is definitely an increase, and it's a lot more varied. Uh, the increase is actually 0.117. Um, uh, I'd also like to note that the temperature was basically constant for all of these. Um, and then here is another trial that we did. Uh, we this was actually our first one, but the results were a little bit more exciting, so we thought we'd save it for this one. Uh, so we started off with um, was it six tons of pressure, and after it plateaued a little bit, I decided I want to see if I can get it up to seven, and you can almost immediately see like a much uh, sharper increase in pH. Um, and then we let it go for a bit, and then we started again for another. Uh, hour or so, and there is a definite difference from our control experiments. Uh, it should be noted in all of these cases that we used calibration solutions for every time that we ran the experiment. Traditionally, we only have to do those one time, and then the probe should be good for life, but we didn't trust that at this point in the summer. Uh, so it was calibrated before every instance, and all of the probes were replaced in their calibration solutions following the experiment to see whether or not it had actually fallen out of calibration due to moving charge carriers. Um, and they were the same in all instances, so the results are not the result of the probes falling out of calibration. Uh, one thing I did mention earlier is that we know because of the work of Dr. Freund that hydrogen peroxide can be produced in very small quantities um, because of these uh, peroxy defects. So, so what we were curious about is if knowing that hydrogen peroxide in a solution can have an interesting effect on the potential difference based uh, pH probes, uh, we were curious to see if the introduction of hydrogen peroxide Caused a 
similar trend. And in this case, we actually saw the opposite. So introduction of a one drop of a 1% hydrogen peroxide solution to 500 milliliters of the same water that we used for our experiment uh, caused a drop of 0 0.02 pH points and then an eventual rise back up to plateau. Uh, you can see the same drop here twice at almost the same level. Uh, we know that since there are not hydrogen ions on hydrogen peroxide, this is not a legitimate change in pH, it's uh, instrument interference, but we know at least that the introduction of this hydrogen peroxide uh, does not cause the trend that we've seen in our data so far. Uh, so, like we said before, these results were obtained uh, within the last two weeks, so we actually decided to push the hydraulic press to the limit, and on our last day of research, we managed to do a trial uh, with conductivity. There was a control in which it was fairly constant at one, uh, I think it was 383, 383 uh, micro siemens per centimeter, and the application of 10 tons, the highest we could get the pressure to go over the course of this period led to an increase in the conductivity of uh, 9 micro siemens per centimeter. Like we said, this was the last day of research, so more trials are necessary in order to confirm just to what extent the pressure applied relates to this change, um, but we can at least be certain at this point that there is uh, some difference that we can continue to explore. Um, something else I'd like to note is we changed water between each trial. Uh, it was the same sterilized pond water, but we weren't reusing the same in every experiment just in case it would change differently based on previous changes that were made. Oh, uh, so in conclusion, uh, the, the small changes for the five to six tons for only a few minutes didn't really show much change in the water at all. Uh, so the pro prolonged uh, greater amount of pressure actually does show an increase uh, in pH and con conductivity supposedly. Um, and they are, in fact, the opposite of the trends seen with the addition of hydrogen peroxide. Um, so, as you can probably tell from the fact that the, the majority of our interesting trials happened within the last two weeks, there's probably a little bit more work to do in this subject. Uh, so, one of the first things that we want to do, and what we really need to do, is to gather real-world pH and conductivity data from these probes. Uh, before the probes are put in, we are not going to be able to design reasonable parameters for what we are looking for when mechanical stress is activating those peroxy defects. So, uh, what we need is insight into the daily fluctuations of those pH in the groundwater or aquifers in which they're installed. If we are seeing very constant values, then we know that any slight stress that we are inducing is going to be visible. If they are changing on the range of an entire pH point, then we're going to need some very big rocks and a much bigger press to figure out um, how exactly we can expect them to be moving. But so gathering real world information to set our parameters to is the first step. Uh, we also need to attempt not only trials with higher pressure and longer exposure, getting a new uh, press like Andre said, uh, we just need to repeat these same experiments um, and see if varying the amount of pressure can vary the amount of increase and um, just making sure that data uh, is repeatable. The pH data that we've shown you, we ran multiple trials on that over the last two weeks and they were consistent. Uh, whereas the conductivity data is a bit more to make sure that we are getting consistent results with each attempt. Uh, and finally, getting new granite samples would definitely be helpful. We know that we have obtained the same results. We actually did run another trial with Andres's work to make sure the current was still being produced at the same level uh, once the channel was introduced, and we know that it is. Um, but we would love to get new granite samples just to have different medium and see what else we can induce with that pressure. All right, are there any questions? Do you have any graphs with the current measurements overlaid with the pH? Unfortunately, we were not able to with the way um, this experiment was set up. As you know from Andres' work, a baseline current had to be applied, otherwise the noise would overrun his measurements. Uh, and if you were to apply a baseline current, uh, you would get false pH readings because it's dependent on that potential difference. That is something we would like to look into, but the problem is with our current setup, uh, the current which fairly certain is being produced is just too small and it will be lost in the noise. We did you have a better idea. <laughs> we did attempt to do it without the baseline voltage, but we couldn't see anything just because the, there's too much noise. And because uh, I'm not familiar with the data sensors, what's the kind of resolution and accuracy to extract from the sensor in relation to the data? Oh, was it? 0.02 was the, 
there would be the um, range of error possibility. Um, but there's more high end ones you can get with even lower, or you can get cheaper ones. With, so, um, depending on how much you want to spend on a PH Pro, is how accurate you can get it. But uh, this one was fairly cheap and it had some. It had we could record down to point zero one uh, pH, so it's pretty pretty decent for a pretty reasonably priced probe. I guess this is a question for anybody, but uh, in the NASA experiments, they used a really long rectangular piece of uh, granite. Do you know? I can't necessarily speak for exactly why. I know at one point in time they actually gave a uh, proposed speed at which the um, the pee holes could propagate. Yeah. I think it was the best speed. Uh, my assumption, looking at that, was that they the more the more space you have to make that measurement, probably the more accurate it will be. But I can't speak to exactly why it was longer. So they had some data from two um, actual data from two with a certain um, distribution that looked like the, the work that they, they used. So they used the work for two things, so to see how fast the those charge move, and second, so that they can scale from what they did in the laboratory to what they observed in the field. And they were able to scale it, I don't know what the values were, but when they scale it up, the currents that they got from the experiment in the lab were comparable to what they were measuring in the field of the scale. How is the data presented to the pH sensor? Is that multiple values you guys averaged? And then we took two data points per second for the uh, entirety of our experiment. So it was basically constantly recording a, a point, uh, two points every second. And we graphed all of them. And it was the same for my data from last year. So there was like hundreds of thousands of points. It was a lot of data. It crashed my computer a few times. In the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next presentation. If there are more questions, we can come back at the end. Hi, my name is uh, William Malice, and I will be talking to you guys about uh, the total electron content or TEC precursors. Um, so now, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about uh, the gold positioning system as we know it uh, today, how it works. Um, the signals that come from there and how that relates to TEC, total electron content, um, and then how that correlates with seismic activities, and then the problem uh, that, that arises from that. that come from there and how that relates. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Um, so I have a quick of four foot five or something. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> uh, requirements, and then the actual solution platform that I created, and then a future work associated with this. So, I want to talk to you guys about uh, global positioning systems, GPS. We all use it. We don't know exactly, at least I didn't know how it worked when I first uh, started to use it. We just pull out our phones, go to maps, go, okay, go here, and it goes, yeah, turn left back there. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, so, the way this whole system works is there are 31 satellites in high orbit around the Earth. Um, at any given time, six of them are visible at least to receivers at any point in the world at any given time. We only need four to calculate position. The reason why is because, uh, as you can see for this picture, if you're familiar with triangulation. Um, you can take three different um, signals from three different places and figure out where you are because um, the intersection of those three circles. The reason why you need four is because we have another um, depth. So. If you have four different satellites and you have a different range, and you have a range that you know it's coming from, the intersection of all those ranges is where you're at. So we have uh, six of them that are, that are visible at any given time, I mean um, a lot better accuracy. So um, the way this works is satellites um, high above in orbit transmit their data over two different frequencies. We call this the L1 and the L2 band. Um, Two different frequencies, L1's at uh, 
1.5 kilohertz. L uh, L2 is at 1.2 um, gigahertz, not kilohertz. I can. Um, civilian GPSs, the GPSs that you use inside of your phone, um, Garmin that you your car uses, um, all use the L1 band triangulate position. This is about accuracy to about 100 meters. That's why when you look on your phone, say where I'm at. You get that nice big blue circle around you saying, yeah, you're somewhere in here. More high-end GPSs, uh, for example, military, um, use both the L1 and L2 bands. Um, this gets you accuracy to a uh, couple meters. Biggest problem with this is it costs $4,000 to $10,000. Not something you exactly want your smartphone. Um, smartphones are expensive as this. So, these signals are affected by the ionosphere. The ionosphere is um, way above about um, 90, 100 kilometers above the Earth, or 400 kilometers above the Earth. Um, and so as this GPS signal propagates through the, um, through the ionosphere, it runs into a bunch of electrons, which then will alter the phase or the speed that it actually gets to you. So if we actually use these phase measurements at the L1 and L2 band, we can actually calculate the number of electrons that uh, it ran into among the line of sight. We call this the total electron content. The way we do this, very uh, simple equation. Um, I'll put simple in quotes. Um, reason why is because you actually need both frequencies in order to do this. So it means you can't really do it with your own cell phone. You have to actually spend money to have a high-end receiver. Um, so the TEC or total electron content in the ionosphere is very, very predictable. It will be the effect of this. About noon time is when you have the most TEC. The reason why is because as the sun comes up and hits the earth, it excites the electrons on the earth, and it then um, excites it into the atmosphere, producing more electrons. And then it starts to dip down, the sun goes down, to right around its lowest around nighttime because the sun's not being down, electrons are kind of settling down on Earth, and there's not a whole lot in the atmosphere. And then as the sun starts to rise, again, you'll get more uh, electrons in the atmosphere. So this is more your normal behavior. What becomes abnormal is when you get a spike. And this is what happens months before a, um, excuse me, an earthquake actually happens. You'll get a sudden spike or jump in electrons that is not normal. You'll see a very sudden large spike at night and you're going, hmm, that's not supposed to be a whole lot of electrons right there. Then after that, it'll be very, very, very agitated. Go up, down, up, down. Not this nice, smooth, simple curve. But, and then afterwards, it'll eventually get back to normal. Uh, what, I, what we're really focusing on for uh, earthquakes is this middle part right here is when it goes to a massive spike and becomes very, very agitated. Okay? So, um, we've been able to show this behavior in the Japan earthquake back in 2011. We showed that there was an abnormally high amount of electrons in the atmosphere, and then it became very, very agitated. Right here you can see the epicenter right there, and you'll see not a very a large dip of electrons, um, where the rest of this is nice and uh, yellow, uh, very, very abnormal. Uh, and again, still here, abnormal, a lot less electrons, and um, this looks pretty uniform. And then eventually it'll get back to normal. So we actually did show this um, with John Hughes, a senior graduated a few years ago. This was his senior design, was to map this all out, find all the electrons, and, and create this, this picture or timeline. Um, so we've been able to show this, but the problem is that we really don't have a way to do this now. Uh, John Hughes, when he did it, was he looked at the data from years ago and said, oh, look, we might have been able to predict that. Good to know. Not very useful for what we really want to do. Uh, so my senior design is starting to uh, get this, uh, these uh, total electron contents in a real-time or near-real-time scenario. Um, that was what I want to do. So, I did some requirements for this. Uh, I wanted to make sure that my program would, uh, it was programmed using the Unreal Engine, popular gaming, uh, gaming program or to develop video games. Um, the way this program worked is that it would show trails to where the satellite has been while we've been tracking it, 
show the TDC for each point. It'll be updated about every 30 seconds. Um, we, I started to do every second. That was a lot of that. A lot of that. Um, and so 30 seconds was more than enough. Um, and then we're going to use that the GPS data to compute TEC, and it'll be queried from MySQL database. This database that I created is going to store all of this information, pseudo range, phase measurements, azimuth angle, and elevation, so we can start to filter out some signals. Um, and it'll all be stored in the table, and the receiver coordinates will be stored in the table. And then satellite positional data will also be stored in the table. This is really used for when I'm trying when I want to go out to other um, companies and other uh, uh, places that have uh, GPS data, you need the, this SP3 data in order to calculate elevation and azimuth angle. Uh, and then I'll also use the data from dual frequency GPS receiver here at ENC on uh, the top of Schrader um, to actually calculate TEC. Um, I'll also start to filter out some cycle slips in here because it's another error that happens. Um, and I'll also be uh, um, removing multipath. Um, pretty much as a satellite is just coming up with the horizon, there's a lot of errors that happen in multipath. So I kind of remove that and elevate and with elevation. So uh, this is the, my real time system that I created. Up here, you'll see the satellite. The satellite will uh, transmit data down to the, our receiver, or this is actually the antenna on the roof of Schrader. Uh, this will then send data to a MySQL database. Uh, this MySQL database will also pull in data from NASA's uh, JPL, um, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They have a lot of, they have receivers worldwide um, that have GPS data that I can pull and pull in and calculate TEC from and also show that. Uh, and then this right over here is actually my program that I created. Um, this query is, all this does is this query is a MySQL database and interprets that data and displays it in a way that we all can see because numbers is not you can't really say a lot of numbers. However, colors are a lot easier to look at instead of just going, oh, look, it's a 10, 10.2. Oh, OK. This is me. So this is actually um, data that we showed. Um, right here is a satellite. Um, this is an actual two scale model of the Earth, um, as well as the distances from the satellite down to Earth, which I didn't realize how high of orbit these satellites are until I made this and went, that's pretty far. Um, and so the way this program works is that as our receiver up on the roof will uh, get data from these satellites, it'll plot them where they are. Uh, this nice trail will actually show where we start to see data from. Um, so you can see, oh look, look at the elliptical uh, shape that the uh, satellites are in. Down here, you'll actually, it shows all the satellites that we're tracking. There's 32, 31 satellites in orbit. They all have a specific PRN number associated with them. So you can actually search what satellites we see, what their range is to our current um, uh, satellite or receiver. You can zoom in on all of them using these buttons. And then you have the receiver right here. Um, this is a TEC. Uh, and then you can also zoom in on that using that button. Um, so if you actually clicked on that button, this is where uh, you zoom in on the Earth. The TEC is represented in a color, uh, in a sphere right here. Um, it will change based on the scale about 0 to 50. Um, 0 being a nice dark blue, 50 being a nice bright red. Uh, and then right here, that box is where we are. Um, and you can actually see to this map that it is to scale. Of that box is right approximately where we are. So in addition to that, um, the near real-time data, I mentioned that I pulled data in from NASA's JPL, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, pulled in about 200 receivers over a course of a couple days. Um, it's a lot of data that I pulled in. Um, and this is just a bunch of the different stations. There's actually a huge list of 200 of them. Uh, and then the way this works is that you can uh, play a movie, in essence. Uh, you can specify, all right, where you want the start time, where you want the end time. So this can be anywhere from like, okay, let's look at what the data is from the past, you know, couple days. Let's see how this has changed. Um, and then you can select stations and say, all right, let's look at this area or let's do uh, um, just an overarching view of everything. And then this delay will say, you know, how often it gets updated. So one means every second it'll move to another 30-second interval.
So it'll actually play as a movie, so you can start to see these things in a real-time scenario. Um, so this is when it's actually playing. Um, you can actually see all the satellites. Um, note, these satellites are actually, um, I made an error in my calculation. They're not actually positioned where they're supposed to be. It's one of my known bugs that I'm working on fixing. Um, but all these other spheres that you'll see are all different receivers worldwide. Um, and along with their TEC associated with them. And down here you can also see all the TEC for uh, all these receivers, um, what their TEC value is, and then you can also zoom in on them if you want to say, oh, let's go, let's go uh, to France and go look at what that receiver is doing over this time period. And you also have some controls up here to say, all right, let's play the movie, pause the movie because that looks weird, or stop and go back to your real time, real -time data. Um, so I, after I did this, I decided, well, let's um, actually put this into a graph so that I can know that what, what I'm seeing is good. And this is a receiver data that I took over the course of, uh, I believe, three days, three or four days, um, in the middle of March or April for the data that we took here at ENC. You can actually start to see this, uh, the um, behavior that I was talking to you about earlier, how it gets a lot higher at noon, dips down below at night, goes back up, dips back down, and goes back up. So this is approximately what we're supposed to be seeing. Now, this is very, very noisy. Um, I know uh, I'm working on trying to filter it out. There's various different um, errors that are associated with this. Um, there's tropospheric error. There's satellite clock bias. Um, there's receiver bias. Um, I haven't filtered those out yet, which is part of the reason why this is so noisy. Um, it's a really, really, really long, complicated process in the process of doing it, but that's going to take a lot more time. Um, in addition to, uh, I wanted to also prove that the data that I was getting from the receivers that I took worldwide, I also plotted that data. So this is from uh, a receiver um, in the U.S., um, also in, in March. Um, you can see that the, the behavior is over the course of one day, how it was lower at night, and then decided to spike. Um, so, what does this mean? Um, how do, what, do we, what does this mean looking forward? Um, the whole purpose of this system is to be dynamic and adaptable. Um, right now it works for GPS signals. I can pull in data from anybody else. I can integrate it into my platform and it will just show it um, so long as it's in the database in the right way. So um, it can be used in a data fusion as a part of a data simulation platform, which Josh and Caleb can talk about. And we'll be talking about a little bit later. But this is the whole purpose of this is to really put a visual aspect on all the measurements, uh, at least right now and for GPS that we've been measuring. Eventually, it can also be used to um, show uh, conductivity, and pH, and water. Um, very, very easily, um, very easily scaled. Um, so there's a lot of people that helped me, Dr. Hornley, who helped really teach me a lot about photoelectron content, because I had no idea what I was doing when I first started. Um, Joshua Loisham and Caleb Batchel were very, very helpful to me as I was developing this program. Um, a good listening ear as I sat there and was like, I have no idea why this isn't working. Let me talk at you for five minutes and go, oh, that's why. Um, Dylan, uh, as a freshman this past year, he helped build the, um, I'm not really that great with all the skins for uh, Unreal. Uh, I do all the background stuff. He actually created the Earth um, for me, that model, um, which actually made it look really, really nice. Uh, Earthram um, was a member of, from Astra. He helped me, um, our, our receiver on the roof, um, the company makes it as Astra. I had to talk with him a lot to try to figure out how to get that data into a form that I could actually use to calculate TPC, uh, so it was really helpful. And then uh, my family for putting up with me and all the late nights that I pulled trying to get this together. Um, and then of course Eastern Western College who made this all possible for me. You skip James. Oh, and James. I'm sorry. Sorry, James. James. James made the satellite, um, the model of the satellite, um, which again, I don't really like modeling. So I was really helpful. Really, really thankful you did that. Because originally I had a nice like cylinder um, rotating around, a nice like blank sphere. Had that for the longest time until uh, James and Dylan decided, hey, look, we can make this look really pretty for you. And I said, 
hey, that looks a lot better. So, any questions? So what, what are the things you have to do sort of finish up the project? So this next semester, um, the, um, I'll be working on filtering out um, cycle slips. Cycle slips are uh, um, words are really nice. Um, cycle slips are kind of when the signal will, or the the pseudo range will attempt to just jump at random. Um, and this can be this can happen because it's a sinusoidal wave coming to you, and you don't actually quite know um, where the phase is. It could be too high um, of that. It's just a sinusoid, so you don't know where and point the sinusoid is. Um, so you'll see random jumps in pseudo range. So I want to start to filter that out. There's various different ways. Uh, I kind of handled that in here. I kind of just said, oh, if it makes a big jump, stop um, and restart my algorithm. Not a very good way to filter out cycle slips, and they're working on other ways to actually correct for it, which is the most ideal way. So that's the my biggest task for, for me um, right now. Um, but the way the system is designed is so that after even after I do that, if anybody else wants to come up after me, I have all my code. It's an algorithm. You just change this one spot, and everything else will be effective. So. Previous students have worked on the other errors, tropospheric, ionospheric, um, and we see the biases and all that. There's a, all that I think John Yu worked on. Yeah. Primarily, Billy wanted to, what if, but for, for John Yu, it was static. I mean, you, you go to a site where you already did, you know, there is data, you take that data, you show the map. So we wanted to be able to say, okay, what about if we go to somewhere anywhere in Europe right now, map it out? Look at the receivers and see the real time yeah. are they changing because if, eventually that's what we want go somewhere in haiti somewhere we put all a bunch of probes for water water and for ph and conductivity we do that for tc we put magnetometers for the magnetic field and then we're monitoring all that stuff in real time so, so most that. most of the errors have yeah yeah we know how to correct all most mostly are except except cycle slips there are algorithms out there to correct cycle slips that we don't like. So we want to do our own, and it's a very difficult problem. The biggest problem for cycle slips is it's very, very easy to do, or it's a lot simpler to do looking back. So, you know, I look back a couple of days, I can filter it out that way. To do it in a real time scenario, you don't quite know exactly whether the jump is true or what data you're supposed to be looking at and how it's going to affect it. It's just a single just spike if it goes back down. James, is this in the signal or the slip? Where is the slip? You're talking about cycle and slipping. It's not the day-to-day -day cycle. Yeah, it's phase ambiguity. It's There's a phase ambiguity. The phase yeah, as in the signal coming down. Right. Yeah. There's an non-known factor in the phase yeah. all the time. Yeah. That's it. So they think about the number of cycles. You don't know, don't know what it is. It's, it's ambiguous. So. So you have to know when to trust it and when not. Yeah. So that so most of the time you look backward for I don't know how to, uh, thirty minutes or thirty seconds depends on the algorithms and try to correct based on what you've seen a few minutes ago and what you're seeing now stuff like that. So this must not be important for GPS or something. No, nope. so it's because you're doing it. Yeah. Like so well, some of these errors you're willing to accept. Yeah. Hundred meters. I mean, you still. I mean, it may tell you from time to time take a left, and it's not a left, but but for most of the time, this is good enough. But when you get the high precision like that, not only you need the two frequencies, but you need the precision also. Yeah. James. Um, so do you know at what rate you want to be able to see the earthquake frequencies from this? I do not know that data. Uh, if I go back um, to the Japan from what John Hughes did, um, I, I didn't really look at modeling data from all the way back then. I was more worried about now. Um, the, the epicenter of that blue dot right there. Yeah. And then you can still see it um, decently far away. So I don't know what exactly that measurement is. I don't think we actually have that kind of data. Um, 
mostly the, well, the biggest reason that we were able to do this is because Japan already had the network of satellites that are like um, there's hundreds and hundreds of satellites all over the country that we can actually create this map. I don't know if there's actually another part of the world that has as dense of a map of G as for GPS satellites as Japan does. So we can't really talk about data for like the Haiti earthquake. We don't have that data. No one has that data. So the wisdom is that when the closer you are from the epicenter, the larger the change should be. But you should actually see changes all throughout your map if they're close enough. They're closely space, which is another challenge. That's not a problem. In the interest of time, we're going to keep moving on. Uh, we're going to take a short break. Uh, we're a little behind schedule, so we're going to shorten our 15-minute break to just about a five-minute break. But um, there's restrooms located one floor down, and there's plenty more food. So help yourselves. You have to go play a video for that right, which is what I tried to do, and I hit the button before the video plays. So <laughs>
So to all of you who are live streaming at home, thank you for being patient through our break. And we're going to get started with our final two presentations, which I'll move back into talking about our data acquisition platform. So we're going to invite Andrew Jane to come up and give the first of those two talks. Hi, my name is Andrew Jane, and I'll be talking about the data acquisition platform Solar Power System. Um, I'll be talking about the problem, the methodology, uh, requirements, as well as the average power required, and any future work. So the problem uh, is to use solar energy to provide power to the data acquisition platform, including the Raspberry Pi and Micro. Um, and we want to use a form of renewable energy that can be independent from a country's power grid. What we know right now is that power grids in third world countries are not reliable. And so the methodology, um, solar energy was new to me as I am a freshman and have very little experience. Um, so I started with researching the very basic background information um, into the technology and how it works. And also, Dr. Crowley gave me a brief lecture on circuit theory as I haven't reached that level in my coursework yet. Um, really helped me understand different circuits. Um, and then I found power requirements after having discussions with each of the research subgroups uh, working on different sensors. And then, and then I did some research to confirm um, the different power requirements. And then looked into some characteristics. Um, in various parts of the world and the expected average power output. And so the requirements, um, I need to build a solar energy management system, um, which means I need to power the Raspberry Pi computer, as well as the um, data acquisition platform all the time is available. And then I have to have a storage capacity large enough to support the same functionalities for the sun as well. And so I had discussions with each of the research subgroups, and they provided me with um, power requirements for each of their sensors. Um, and then I did some research to confirm this, and then put it in a nice table, um, showing the input voltage, input current, and the power in watts. And then I added the power to the total power required, about 12.8 watts. And so some characteristics. Um, I visited a website from the U.S. Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and they have flat plate collectors or photovoltaic panels, which measure the average daily solar radiation. And that gets displayed in a map. Um, as you can see on the left in the key, the different colors represent kilowatt hours per square meter per day. Um, and as you get into the darker color red, um, we have more power. Um, and in this map of Haiti and the Dominican Republic, um, around this area of the arrow, you can see that it's this white orange color which corresponds to 5.5 to 6 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. And then here's a map of the entire United States. And same thing with the key, uh, different colors represent kilowatt hours per meter squared per day darker color represents more power. Um, and in the Boston area, it shows this uh, medium orange color which corresponds to 4.5 to 5 kilowatt hours um, per meter squared per day, uh, which is fairly similar to that in Haiti. So we'd be able to effectively test whatever system we come up with in this area. Um, so here's a solar management system. The solar panel takes in energy from the sun, and the solar energy monitor and battery bank uh, make up the circuit, which provides power to the platform of the Raspberry Pi microcomputer. And then this is the diagram of the test circuit. Uh, so the solar energy comes in, and then you have a regulator that keeps the voltage at around five volts, um, and then the resistor sends um, 
that voltage to the batteries to charge it. And then, and then down here, the circuit loops back to correct the voltage. Um, and I was able to use this test circuit to successfully charge AA batteries under incandescent light. Um, and the rate of charge was 0.135 volts per hour. So future work, um, I need to design a new circuit to meet the power requirements. And I'm shooting for 100 watts, which is more than what we need. Um, and we also want to use a rechargeable battery pack to provide power when the sun is not out. And when designing the battery, this battery, I need to take into consideration that the sun is not always out and storms may block sunlight for a day or two. And then also look for the sun characteristics more specifics. Any questions? What kind of rechargeable batteries are you guys looking at? Um, well, for this test circuit, we use double A batteries. Um, and I'm not sure yet what type of batteries we're looking at. Yes, we don't know. We very very early on this this, this uh, design, so we don't know yet. If you have ideas, yeah, we'll talk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any more questions for James? Do you have any idea on the cost of the layout you have so far, like the solar panel itself? Or the... Um, I I did some research into that, and the solar panel. Um, that I found, um, I believe, was around hundred dollars. So um, that's really the only thing that I have an idea of price ones. That's probably most expensive part. Yeah, I believe so. So we might be able to get away with smaller, smaller um, solar panels because the idea would be to. Uh, the, 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 the entire package would be very small. We don't want it to be very big. So we might be able to get away with smaller, smaller panels. Uh, since we're behind, we're going to move on. <laughs> Are you designing this so that it's small enough to take with you during the day? Uh, yes. So the goal currently, we always have big goals. <laughs> is next summer to have a, a platform somewhere <coughs> else with at least the, the sensors we've been working on. And to have this start collecting data, remoting it back here. Oh, but it's, it's, this doesn't have to be mobile, because it, yeah, it, yeah. yeah, this doesn't have to be mobile, but eventually, yeah. yeah. Well, it cannot be too big too, but yeah. yeah. Because one of the other thing is to put several of them on the phone. Yeah. So 20, 30 of them along the fault line somewhere, kind of a map configuration, and then you take it on that data. Right. So uh, Josh and I are back up to kind of close out and tie together everything that you've heard today. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, the data acquisition platform. So basically what that's going to mean is you've heard about all these sensors. How are we working with them together? <laughs> um, so like we, like we talked about before, uh, we have this platform that we would like to take in all of these sensors. Uh, so you heard students talk about uh, many of these sensors, and there are a few more on listed on here that we would like to implement that just uh, we haven't done any research in yet. Uh, but we have plans for the future for those. But essentially what Josh and I have done is designed a remote platform uh, to collect data from all of these sensors in remote locations such as uh, Haiti along the lines. So um, just to kind of get into the, the nitty gritty a little bit of what we need this platform to be able to do. Uh, first, we need it to support uh, each of the earthquake precursor sensors that you heard about uh, throughout this morning together, and then also ones that we'll be researching and developing in the future. 
uh, which include GPS for position and time and GPS for total electron content. Uh, those are different things. Uh, just to clarify, GPS for position and time allows us to synchronize the platform with other platforms and uh, give us to the precise location of where a platform is deployed. Uh, GPS for total electron content is what Billy talked about in measuring the changes in the ionosphere as an earthquake precursor. Uh, we'd also like to include some type of weather, uh, weather measurements on the platform, so uh, pressure and temperature. Uh, and then also we'd like to use a network of seismometers and network of magnetometers uh, to uh, monitor faults, as well as water chemistry sensors that you heard about with JT and Nick, and air chemistry sensors that we hope to research in the future. Uh, the second requirement is that the system shall provide the power for all of these sensors. Uh, and this is kind of what Andrew was talking about, all of the power requirements for every sensor, including the, the platform itself, uh, need to come need to come through the platform and to the sensors. And that's how the entire device will be powered. Uh, additionally, we require a certain level of precision for uh, intaking data. And so we uh, determined it through some experiments and research that the level of precision that we need for our analog <coughs> sensors is 0 0.0001 volts. Uh, the fourth system requirement is that it should record this data and transmit the recorded data then to the central server which will be hosted here at ECC. And additionally, the platform shall be self-sufficient with power, meaning that uh, it will be powered by some renewable energy source. So, um, you've heard about all these sensors. One of the problems that we need to do is we need to collect this data remotely and we need to upload it to ENC so that we can analyze it here. Uh, so basically what we've done is we've designed a, uh, what we're calling the platform, the remote platform, out of a Raspberry Pi 3 microcomputer. So basically that's what you see right here. It's a tiny little computer that runs on Linux. Um, however, this uh, computer, it has something called GPIO pins, but they only take uh, digital signals. So we also need an analog to digital converter. So all of these uh, sensors that these lovely folks have been designing, um, they put out analog signals, so raw voltage and things like that. Uh, so we implemented an Adafruit's ADS1115, which is a 16-bit analog to digital converter, um, which basically allows us to take in the readings, the raw voltage readings, and convert them to a digital data that we can read from this uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, the data is read into the Pi via these uh, GPIO pins that I talked about in something called I2C configuration. Um, it's a it's a universal bus, which most of you would be more familiar with something like this called USB. Um, it's basically the same thing, uh, but it's it's the pin-to-pin -pin connection of basically what USB is. Um, and then we do minor processing in Python on the platform before we upload to ENC. Uh, so the algorithm that we've designed is fairly straightforward. Uh, so it's based on something called a data dump protocol. Uh, so what we do is we record data continuously at different sample rates uh, via this uh, ADC and the Raspberry Pi, and we save it to CSV files on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, then after some predetermined time period, uh, we connect to a database at ENC, and we dump all of the data that we've taken for that day onto the ENC server. Uh, so that's what you see here uh, in this data dump. And we've designed it with something called multi-threaded processing, uh, which basically means, so you see how these arrows split off into two parts. That will allow us to uh, not only upload data, but also record data simultaneously. So there is no loss in data collection while we're dumping the, the previously recorded data to the NC. Uh, so to just kind of expound a little bit on uh, the methodology that Caleb talked about, the server that we are currently running here at ENC to host all of our data is a Linux CentOS server, and it's running in what's called a Hyper-V machine or a virtual machine uh, on our supercomputer, which is housed uh, currently in IT. Eventually, it'll be housed back in Trader after the renovations are finished. And uh, we've decided to work with what's called InfluxDB databases. Um, and basically, InfluxDB uh, is a time series database, and all of the data that we're gathering in the field is all based on timestamps. And so we've decided to work with a time series database which allows for faster processing of the data and allows us to uh, basically eliminate unnecessary um, relational kinds of things that, that would be used in other databases like MySQL. Uh, additionally, this server has to be public facing. So basically what that means is that the server has to be available to people 
or to a computer that's outside of ENC's network. And this is necessary because the platforms are obviously not going to be here on campus. So the server has to be public facing. And so we went through a process uh, called hardening, which basically allows us to make the server secure so that it can be made public facing and data can then be transmitted from basically anywhere that we deploy platform back here to ENC. So additionally, uh, right now we're running this uh, CentOS server on um, a Hyper-V machine on our supercomputer. Uh, we're seeking funding currently to purchase a long-term data storage solution. So after a while, with several of these platforms re recording data continuously, uh, that's going to fill up storage pretty fast. Uh, so we're looking to purchase a server with uh, something called RAID storage, uh, which will basically be a large data storage that has redundancies uh, to allow for uh, if some of the data is corrupted, uh, we can sort of account for that. Uh, so getting a little bit more into the database design, um, so there's this company called Influx Data that produces what they call the tick stack. Um, and it's a method for uh, obtaining and looking at time series uh, data. So it's an open source time series platform that uh, provides components for every step of the time series uh, analysis from the point where we collect it to the point where we analyze it. Uh, so they create four products. Um, uh, currently, we've implemented two, and we plan to implement all four in the end. Uh, the first one is called Telegraph, uh, which has to do with data collection. So we've interfaced that with the custom Python scripts that we wrote. Uh, that's what facilitates the uploading of the data to this InfluxDB database that Josh already mentioned. Um, the second element is obviously the InfluxDB database. So as Josh mentioned, this is something called a time series database. So all of the measurements that we take from these sensors are referenced against time, right? Because we're trying to look at them in relation to when an earthquake is going to occur. Uh, so using a specialized uh, database called a time series database allows us to do a little bit easier processing as well as uh, higher compression so we don't take as much uh, data storage as something uh, like MySQL or Oracle. Uh, Chronograph is a data visualization and analysis tool. Uh, we currently have not implemented that, but we do have plans to in the future. Uh, basically, it allows us to easily connect to the database to plot the data. Uh, so we can look at any of the data that we've collected so far from any of the deployed platforms uh, in near real time uh, using this uh, graphical tool. And capacitors, my favorite part of the whole thing, although we haven't implemented it yet, it'll be the backbone of the real-time processing. Uh, so once we have uh, these platforms in different locations and they're recording data back to ENC, uh, we don't want to necessarily have to look at this data all the time. Uh, so what we're going to do, uh, this is obviously a little bit down the road in the research, but uh, we plan to write an algorithm that will basically analyze this data in real time or near real time to look for anomalies that we associate with earthquakes. And Capacitor is the program that Influx Data produces that will allow us to do that. Uh, so this is sort of a diagram of the same sort of setup. Uh, at the core of it all is this Influx DB, uh, the time series database. So we have this telegraph that's taking in metrics uh, from our Raspberry Pis and all of the sensors and uploading them to this Influx DB. Uh, we're going to be using Chronograph uh, for us to request data when we want to look at a specific section, as well as Capacitor, uh, which will query the InfluxDB database in real time for processing, as I just said. Uh, so some kind of first uh, preliminary results that we obtained uh, kind of partway through the summer. Uh, we have the external analog to digital conversion working, so that ADS1115 that Kayla mentioned earlier in the presentation uh, is currently uh, successfully working. We're reading in data on each of its four available channels uh, at different sampling rates, and then uh, uploading that, or uploading that, sending that to the Raspberry Pi, which is which then uploads it to uh, the InfluxDB database. Uh, we are also using unique sample rates for each sensor based on needs. So uh, James talked about a particular sample rate that he needed for the magnetometer, and other sen uh, other sensors typically would need a lower sample rate. So what we've done is we've uh, designed the program in such a way that each of the channels on the analog to digital converter can uh, take in data at the sample rate that we need them to. Uh, we've also, because of the 
use of this 16-bit analog to digital converter, uh, we've, been, we've been able to achieve that four decimal place, decimal place of precision uh, that we had outlined in our system requirements at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, the multi-threaded data dumps are also functioning, which means that uh, we've tested the platform and we see no loss in data when we are dumping data uh, to the server and then also continuing to intake data into the resume file. Uh, in addition, the hardening of the CentOS server is complete, which, which means that the server is live, it's public facing, and we've been able to test uh, uploads to the server off of ENC's network and it's functioning exa exactly as it should be. Uh, so you'll see this is a graph of some uh, simulated data that we did. So before we went to ADC reads, uh, basically we made a simulation in our computers of what this ADC would actually produce and we uploaded it. So that's what you see here is uh, tests of the pins for simulated data. And uh, we've successfully uploaded that to the public facing server and queried with uh, billions of data points processing with Python. So. What that means is this shows no sign of slowing down, even under billions and billions of data points. Uh, so we did extensive tests on this InfluxDB server, uh, this InfluxDB database, to make sure that I could handle the loads that uh, we're producing. Like I said, once we have multiple platforms all producing data in near real time, it's going to accumulate pretty fast. So we needed to be sure of that this database can handle it, and we've successfully done that with billions of data points. So in addition to that kind of simulated data, we've run several tests uh, using sensors that uh, students have built. Uh, and so this is the first kind of set of uh, first tests that we performed where we read magnetometer data into one pin of the analog to digital converter over a period of two hours, and we were able to achieve a maximum sample rate of 85 samples per second which far exceeds our need of uh, roughly 10 samples per second for this device. And you can see this is just some kind of dummy data of us waiting a magnet around the sensor uh, to show that it's working properly. Additionally, uh, we hooked up four separate sensors. Uh, we hooked up a magnetometer, a solar panel, uh, a temperature sensor, and a seismometer. Uh, and we were able to read all of those with unique sample rates uh, into the uh, into the database simultaneously, and that's what you see based on this graph. Uh, so, like I said, we did it over a period of three days, and actually, it's continuing to read now. So now we're up to about five days, and we basically losslessly done the data for five days, uh, which is showing promise that uh, the algorithm is functioning well. Uh, and so like I said, we've been able to test with very wide variety of sample rates from two samples per minute to 85 samples per second. So uh, depending on what the sensor need is, we can absolutely accommodate this. So basically, the conclusions from the work that we've done this summer are that simultaneous recording, processing, and uploading of the data uh, to the InfluxDB server is functioning. And this shows promise for a long term uh, as a long-term solution for deploying platforms in the field. The CentOS server, like we said earlier, is live and public face, and we've been able to successfully upload data uh, off of ENC's network. So what this means for us now is that essentially we're ready to manufacture a true prototype for deploying into the field. So this true prototype would include the Raspberry Pi, sensors from each of the students when they're finished, and once all of that uh, gets put together, we're ready to deploy uh, this sensor. So a little bit of future work, uh, like Josh just mentioned, uh, we need to actually manufacture this deployable prototype. Uh, also, we need to optimize the code, the algorithm that Josh and I wrote, for easy changes in the field. Uh, so when we're deploying multiple of, uh, multiple platforms at different locations, uh, we need to be able to change the program so that we know what uh, data we're recording off of each of the ABC pins and things like that. Uh, so we need to optimize the code a little bit. Um, like I said, we need to deploy a full-scale platform prototype soon and begin development of a data fusion algorithm. So what that'll mean is once we have collected some data uh, from the field from this full-scale prototype, we'll develop some sort of algorithm to fuse this data together to give some sort of metric about uh, the probability of an earthquake occurring in that location. Our current thoughts right now are to use uh, some form of binary classification machine learning. Uh, and implement capacitor for real-time data processing, as I've already talked about. 
Oh, and purchase the data storage server as I talked about. So uh, kind of what's next, uh, not just for us, but for the overall uh, research. Um, so earthquake forecasting research is kind of at an all-time high right now. There are many groups uh, around the US and around the world working on it. And we've been in collaboration with a lot of those groups. Uh, we, as, a, as ENC, have made significant strides in the past few summers. So you've heard about uh, some of the work that the students have been doing. Uh, we have many functioning prototypes. Uh, we also have several published papers, uh, including, so we have published papers, we have papers in review, and we have papers that are currently being written, all in the field of earthquake forecasting. Uh, so we've also lowered the cost and availability for forecasting research. So generally speaking, uh, these experiments were produced with millions of dollars, and we've been able to do it on a very low budget, uh, which is promising for the fields. Uh, and we're near re nearly ready for deployments. Uh, the research is also extremely valuable for ENC. It's a humanitarian effort, uh, and it fits in well with uh, ENC's social justice uh, initiatives. It also gives students like us real-world research experience, which is invaluable when we're applying to graduate school and going on to, into the job markets. And we've been able to develop partnerships with outside organizations. So you've heard James talk about QuakeFinder. You've heard many of us mention uh, Freund's. Um, so we've been able to establish these relationships with outside organizations and outside scientists and collaborate with them. So in terms of the research itself, uh, kind of the what's next, we'd like to expand the size more electricity research that Andres and Nick and JT were talking about. Uh, so we'd like to continue uh, trying to combine the seismoelectric and water chemistry experiments uh, and potentially add sensors to that experiment for any changes in air chemistry or the, or the magnetic field uh, that is produced by those currents. Uh, and we also, in order to do this, we need to purchase a new press that can handle the pressure and time loads that we need. Uh, and once we have a new press purchase, then we should be able to uh, continue those experiments and get uh, better and more data. Additionally, we need to continue to work on designing precursor sensors. So the magnetometer uh, made big strides this summer. James did a great job working on that. And we need to finalize that design. Also need to complete uh, a seismometer design and purchase chemistry sensors for deployment in the field. Uh, and then another, another big challenge will be implementing TEC in the field. Uh, as was talked about earlier, TEC requires a two-band GPS receiver and those cost thousands of dollars. So we need to find a way to uh, fund implementing TEC uh, in remote locations where we will deploy the Raspberry Pi platforms. Uh, and then, like we've mentioned multiple times throughout the presentation, a full-scale prototype. So we need to manufacture the full prototype platform and uh, explore the connections that Dr. Cornelly has in Haiti in order to uh, initially deploy a platform and test and uh, kind of understand the data that we're getting around faults in Haiti. And then we also need to continue to pursue funding for deployment and for all of the research uh, for development of sensors and for basic science research so that we can understand the data that we're actually getting uh, once we have the ability to deploy these platforms in the field. Uh, so a few acknowledgments. Uh, I know the whole group would like to thank uh, Dr. Pierre Shark Cornley. Uh, he's been the PI for this research. And more than that, he's been a mentor to all of us. And just a really great resource and a teacher to all of us. Uh, Dr. Friedman Freund, uh, who has had many private communications with us and helped us along uh, with our research, especially in the seismoelectricity experiments. Uh, ENCITS uh, has helped us a lot with uh, transitioning the server to the public face so that we can uh, work on deploying the platform. Dr. Timothy Worcester, who has been an advocate for summer research and has pushed to get us funding for the past couple of years. Uh, Dr. Brad Zargis and the entire athletics faculty and staff, summer research would not have been possible this summer without the uh, space in the gym uh, that we use for our lab. So we owe a great deal to them. And of course, Eastern Nazarene College for providing us the opportunity and the funds uh, to continue this research. So if you have any questions about the platform, anything else about the program, or any of the work that you've heard about today, feel free to, uh, to ask them now. Yeah.
Yeah, so uh, we're exploring uh, cellular connections, which generally is the most reliable internet connection in third world countries. Um, so basically what we'll do is we'll have some sort of cellular shield attached to the Raspberry Pi, uh, which will allow us to connect to ENC over the internet. So I guess I'm lost in where the, the raw data versus uh, analyzing the data comes in for play. So we go back. You can see, I mean, you can see in the graphs that uh, what we've plotted in our result slides are basically just uh, the conversion of the analog voltages to to a digital uh, signal. And converting back is really just a matter of understanding the conversion forward, right? So it's a kind of a multiplication of uh, uh, factors that uh, are used to convert from digital, from analog to digital. So the focus of this particular research was not necessarily on the um, the analysis of any data because we don't really have any data to collect. It was more of a focus of how are we going to collect data in the future to analyze. The ETC is going to be part of this. So yes. <clears throat> so that analysis will all take place somewhere else, and then be trans the final sort of data will be transferred. So the way it's looking right now is that uh, in order to save processing power and data on the platform, uh, we're going to upload raw data to ENC and then process it back here using our supercomputer. So the calculations for error correction tend to be kind of intensive and the hardware for Raspberry Pi is not super supportive of intensive calculations. So you talked a lot about the time series. So how are you syncing up your time frame? Stop say time zone. Yeah, so there's uh there's something called NTP network time protocol. Uh, so all of the servers at ENC reference a uh, a public uh, NTP server, and we're gonna point our databases or our, sorry, our individual platforms to the same NTP server. So that time will be synchronized, uh, UTC time will be synchronized between any deployed platforms and what we're looking at at ENC. I, I suggest you look at the GPS. Uh, you're already getting GPS in contact with the time. Yeah. Only thing is you need very good GPS for that. Or else you will drift over a period of time you drift. So right now they're using very cheap GPS to do some other stuff. If you want Time synchronization with GPS and many of them. Uh, the other thing is, um, there's a huge part of this of this work that's yet to be done in terms of when you get the data, how do you uh, fuse it into one picture? Right? You can look at. I mean, eventually we'll get to a point where we know how every one of these sensor data behave in terms of telling us something is different. But what we want, we want to go beyond that. We want to take all this information, fuse it into one parameter, and then make that what we use for forecast. That hasn't even begun yet. It's a totally different Well, Hopefully some students will come along and hold <laughs> yeah. they, They'll be uh, brave enough to, to tackle some of that over certain, certain amount of years. So I guess I'm still confused about where. So uh, on the uh, on the electron concentration, the <coughs> uh, data is going to come back to the ENC server, where it will be analyzed separately from the dashboard. Yeah. So these are just basically preliminary graphs that we pulled together yeah. uh, without any data analysis. So what we'll do is uh, we'll write something called a cron job, uh, which is basically a script that runs periodically. So every time we get a data dump, we'll run this error correction script on the data um, and then re-upload it to the database. So we'll have corrected data after that so that we can analyze for uh, actual error signals. Does that make sense? Uh, a little bit more, but uh, not so. All the corrections uh, that they're going to make to that data will be done before it's passed to the dashboard. Yes. 
these yeah. others are simple, so they right. could almost directly come to the dashboard. Right. Like I said, this is this these were preliminary graphs yeah. that we put together because we haven't implemented the uh, that part of the tick stack yet. Do you guys have an idea how, how much storage you need? Um we talked about it. It's difficult to determine uh, without knowing the exact needs of each uh, sensor, which we don't quite know yet. Uh, we were talking at probably 10 gigabytes per year or so. So it's not super a lot, but it's definitely something that will be dedicated hardware for. And also, it also you know, largely depends on the amount of platforms that we're able to, right. to prototype and deploy. If we deploy five or something or 50, it's going to make a big difference. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the idea is like we've been doing is we, we, we try to crawl first. And maybe we can stand up and and walk slowly, and then maybe we can start jogging. So the idea is that you start with one platform with five or six <coughs> sensors, you collect data for a year or two, and it gives you a good a good feel for for what the problem is going to be. Yeah, that's why we're trying to push for that to happen sooner than later. Yeah. I'd like to thank you all for coming today. Uh, I know we've all enjoyed presenting our work to you. And thank you to anybody that tuned in online. Um, feel free to stick around after the presentations and ask uh, students any questions. Um, and eat more food. Eat more food. There's lots. <laughs> thank you very much. Come again next year. Better. You should have